All right, today is the top fails with filtration media like GFO and carbon. I've made tons of them. I've listened to tons of them on the phone. <laughs> uh, we used to try to keep this stuff to like top 10 fails, but we failed at that too. So yeah. it's top like 21, I think, today. <laughs> yep. Uh, so what is the first one? It's running GFO 24 seven. This thing is a tool with a very specific purpose and should be used as such rather than a massive hammer to smash down a problem. Yeah, so if you run it 24 seven, you're gonna have double zero phosphate mm. all the time. And we used to do that to fight algae, but now there's all kinds of ways to fight algae. Yeah. And there's also other ways to keep phosphate down, including just grow your corals faster. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we don't do that anymore. And so GFO should really be used as a periodic tool mm. to allow the levels to be in a safe range. So just don't let them go too high. Because uh, if you use it all the time, you're gonna be running double zeros and it's probably not good for your tank. Okay, so number two is actually just the mentality behind why anybody would even use GFO. Yeah, and that's the mistake right there, is not understanding why we use GFO and getting back to what we just said, you know, phosphate is a fuel source for algae and GFO is a good tool for removing phosphate. Yeah, so if you keep your levels ultra low, like below 0.03, Algae, for the most part, just won't grow in your tank. That means you clean the glass less often, means that hair algae isn't growing. Some things like bryopsis just don't seem to care <laughs> and they'll grow anyway. But for the most part, algae will actually stay at bay in your tank. However, also, mm. uh, the reason you keep it low is because the phosphate will actually poison the calcium carbonate crystal, preventing it from growing, meaning calcification slows down, all your stony corals start growing slower. So those are the two reasons why most people will maintain fairly low levels of phosphate in their tank, and most commonly using GFO. However, when we fast forward to today's conversation, most people are not shooting for 0.03 anymore because it's actually really hard to maintain anything between 0.03 and zero. <laughs> it's a true. really small range, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And so what we're really using this now for is a periodic tool to make sure that the phosphate levels just don't get out of hand. Number three is actually something I experienced in my very first tank and kind of sneaks up on you. Mm. Mistake on this one is not understanding GFO's effect on nitrate which we'll give you the answer right now is none. And so when you think about it, you put food in your tank, right? And it adds phosphorus, it adds nitrogen, and GFO is really good at removing phosphates. That's what it's intended for. What it does to nitrates is leaves them alone, does nothing. So nitrates just rise, 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 and rise. The uh, worrisome part of this is, meanwhile, the tank looks awesome. Right? <laughs> There's true. no algae in there, it looks pristine, mm. but the nitrate levels just keep rising and rising and rising, uh, presumably at some point toxic. Right. But actually, the biggest problem is then one day you just don't change out your GFO in time and the phosphorus levels start to rise. Uh. At that point, algae out of everywhere, right? And once it gets a foothold, it's really hard to beat. So that is one of the things you need to make sure that when you're controlling just phosphate, is you have some other mechanism for controlling nitrate as well. All right, so number four can actually save you some time and money. Yeah, and the mistake is not knowing when GFO is depleted. So in this case, you know, I know what my phosphate levels are. I've, I'm using GFO for a specific purpose. And uh, as I continue to test and monitor, and I'm not changing my food input, not really changing much uh, about the input of phosphorus into the tank, but my phosphate levels start to rise. Easy indicator of my GFO is depleted. So everybody like a super simple answer, change it out every two weeks. But the reality mm -hmm. is, is if you put two cubes of food in your tank uh, every day and yeah. I only put one, well, my GFO is going to last twice as long as yours. Yeah. So it's just not a straight answer like that. So just monitor your phosphate. And as soon as it starts to rise, you'll know to change out your GFO. But more importantly, you're probably adding the same amount of food every day. So if it took you two or two, two weeks or two months last time, it'll probably take you about that same amount of time next time. All right, so number five is actually not a filtration media, but it's so close, I think that we should include it in the conversation here. Yeah, and this is the mistake of missing the liquid type of phosphate remover, like phosphate E. Unlike GFO, which is just a mighty hammer, I can drop them my levels down to zero pretty easily. This one's scalable and adjustable, and I can adjust my dose to fine tune, you know, where I want my phosphate levels to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we saw that over at the WWC series. So Josh mm -hmm. told us that the reason that he uses it is because it allows him to not just hit zero or you know wherever it's at, at the time. He can actually control it by controlling the amount of dose. So if you find out that 10 milliliters or 100 milliliters takes your tank from 0.5 to 0.3, you'll do that every time. So you can really control the dose in here really easy and it's a much more finite tool. 
All right, so number six, moving on to a different media. You may have spent thousands of dollars on some equipment in your tank, but yet just a buck's worth of carbon could actually transform how you use it. Yeah, and that mistake is missing that connection between PAR and carbon and water clarity and what carbon can do to your PAR. So you might be losing, like you said, upwards of like 30% of your PAR in some of the tanks that we've tested just because the yellow pigments in your water uh, are there and carbon can remove those pigments. Yeah, so we did a couple of those experiments pulling actual water out of the tanks here at BRS and some of them that hadn't run carbon in a long time did reduce the PAR by up to 30%. All right, so I talked to Dana Riddle about it for a little bit and he wasn't surprised by that number at all mm. because it's those yellow pigments in the water, the yellow pigments actually filter out the blue spectrum which mm. is the PAR in our tank. So it's not surprising. So if you wanna get extra performance out of your lighting or you don't want uh, the levels of PAR in your tank to fluctuate all the time or to deteriorate as you add more food, just run a buck's worth of carbon and can solve that entirely. All right, so number seven, emergency time. <laughs> Uh, the mistake is not having carbon around in case of emergencies. Not all of us have a full water reservoir or large enough water reservoir sometimes for a big water change should something happen to the tank, in which case you can slow down or maybe remove whatever's going on toxins uh, by adding in some carbon. And this is specifically true if you have a large tank or oh, like yeah. doing big water changes just aren't even an option. Or even if you have a reasonable sized tank and you just don't have that big of a water bin or salt made up all the time. Mm. So you can just use a few dollars worth of carbon and pull out all kinds of contaminants from the tank, whether it be from the corals themselves or your hands or something in the air. So even if you don't run carbon all the time, have 10 bucks worth of carbon around on hand so you can solve problems in real time. All right, so number eight, we just kind of covered, but one of the reasons you use carbon all the time. Yeah, they're missing the value of carbon on coral toxins and toxins in the tank from the, like the inhabitants. Something I experienced firsthand in my little tank on my desk, uh, added some pallies and the next day everything was dead. And I imagine that if I had some carbon running on that tank, uh, I could have at least drawn out some of those toxins. Yeah, it's hard to say when you add corals yeah. like that and everything dies, but why would adding pallies die? So, yeah. But there's toxins in those corals, a lot of soft corals have them, and it's specifically when they die or flatworms die, they let out toxins into the water, mm. which carbon can actually remove. Number nine is another one of those things where you like a one size fits all answer, uh. but there really just isn't one. Yeah, and this is not knowing when the carbon's depleted and needs to be changed. And there's a couple of solutions to this problem. And that is, for those of you with a PAR meter, find a spot in your tank where you know the PAR and test that periodically. If you've lost 10%, 15%, it's time to change out your carbon. For everybody else, the white bucket test where fresh water in one, old tank water in the other, you'll see a yellow pigment. It's time to change out your carbon. It should look pristine blue inside that white bucket and next to it it will almost certainly look uh, like a orangey yellow and if you run some carbon for just a matter of probably 10 minutes in the tank and then mm. took a bucket out you'd see it looks pristine blue again another way just to get a really quick glance at it is look the long way mm. through your tank yeah. with all the lights out on the tank and you'll see that it's probably visibly yellow if that's the case run some carbon and it'll turn pristine blue again all right, number 10, another way to save some money. Yeah, the mistake here is using too much carbon in hopes that you're actually getting longer life out of it or more efficiency out of it when, in fact, you're really not. You're just kind of say, throwing money down the drain here. And that's because that carbon gets bound up with biofilms and, you know, waste and stuff like that. So, you know, I may have one cup and think two cups is going to last me longer but it's actually gonna get clogged up just as fast as the one cup, and now it just becomes ineffective. Yeah, so if we were using this on fairly pure water, like tap water, one cup will probably actually last about as half as much as two cups. Mm. But in our case, again, all that biofilm and bacteria slimes building on it, there's all kinds of organics in there, and it just doesn't uh, act as linear as that. Maybe two cups last 1.2 times <laughs> as long, and really anybody that says that it lasts longer than a tank is just wrong. Mm. I don't say that kind of thing very often, but it just doesn't behave that way in an aquarium. So use a small amount of carbon and change it out more frequently to get the best results. All right, so number 11 applies to both GFO and carbon mm -hmm. and something you probably do, but maybe not well enough. Yeah, and the mistake is not rinsing either of those medias thoroughly enough, in which case, you know, whether you have it in a filter bag or a reactor, there's a 
easy way to do this. Reactors, I just run the end of the hose after a fresh change into a white bucket so that I'm looking down into the bucket, watching for fines, maybe swap that bucket out and keep filling it to make sure that there's no fines. Uh, and then a filter bag, you can, you can easily run it under the sink, you know, without grinding it together or washing it, just run it under the sink until the water runs clear. So one of the reasons that you wanna make sure that you use that second bucket like you mentioned, mm -hmm. is because if you're just looking through a half inch of water coming out the spout, you won't really see the fines. Yeah. So you wanna fill up that second bucket and make sure it's free. And one of the reasons that we do that is because head and lateral line disease has been linked to dusty fines. Mm. So, and people not rinsing their carbon very well. So it's really beneficial to use a harder carbon like the ROX, in some cases the bituminous, especially if you're not really skilled at washing it and getting <laughs> all the fines out. But if you use a filter sock, I would definitely use a harder carbon like the ROX. Number 12 is actually one of the first mistakes I made. I bought a five gallon pail of this type of carbon. I thought it was the best, but it wasn't. <laughs> And the mistake that he made was thinking that the larger pellets were better than the smaller. They look better, but are they really? Yeah, so they're not. They're designed for air, these big uh, few mm. millimeter large pellets. Uh, and they're designed for air because they remove the contaminants from a gas really, really well. Mm. However, for water, the water just channels all around them. So they look uniform, they're hard, yeah. and they're relatively dust free but they work terrible actually <laughs> in water. And we've done a bunch of experiments that mm. clearly demonstrated that. So tiny uniform pellets like the ROX work way better in water because they're designed for water. All right, so number 13 is something almost nobody thinks about. And this is where your filter media comes from, which filter media removes things from the aquarium, but can also add things back to the aquarium. And that's about all about the source material. So coconut, wood, coal, you know, peat moss, they can all have things in them that go back into the tank. Yeah, they call water the universal solvent, actually. Yeah. So uh, pretty much anything, any material put in water will actually extract some of that thing out into the water. Mm -hmm. So when the coal is mined out of the ground or you carbonize the coconut or peat moss or wood, you're getting rid of most of the impurities, but not all of them. And it really depends on the quality of the source material. And on top of that, it also, the rinsing and washing afterward. Mm -hmm. So some of them are acid washed, some of them are water washed, some of them water washed, acid washed, and then acid neutralized. Obviously, the more process or steps you go through, the cleaner it gets. Mm. And something like the ROX here, it's actually designed for use with pharmaceutical intermediaries. And for that reason, they've gone through all those steps and it's gonna add the least amount of impurities back to the water and pull the most out. So that about sums up number 14 as well. Yeah, and this mistake is assuming that all carbons are the same. And even though they look different in size and shape, they also perform different in how they remove from the water. In fact, actually, many of them that even look identical in yeah. person perform differently because you don't know how they've been treated or what they're made out of. Mm. Some of those materials performing way better at large, medium, or small molecules in our water. In our case, uh, most of the organics are fairly long uh, molecule chains and very large organics we're trying to remove with larger pore carbons. And so we've done a few experiments here where we've removed those uh, or tested removing small, mm -hmm. medium, and uh, large molecules. You can see in all of our tests that they perform dramatically different. And so it's, even though some of these things actually cost a little bit more, if I can get 5x the performance <laughs> out of one size carbon and it only cost me twice as much, that's a net win. All right, so number 15 is actually the cheapest possible way to run carbon in your tank. It actually works. And the mistake is not understanding how the filter bag and filter media bag works, where I can just fill the thing with carbon, put it in a high flow area, and get nearly the same performance and efficiency as running a reactor. Uh, you might have to use a little bit more, mm -hmm. and it probably won't last as long, but it's super easy to use. Yeah. So if you have large baffles, sometimes they'll put the bag right between the baffles mm -hmm. so you're getting water flowing through it, and that's the important part here. If you're gonna use a bag, you have to put the bag of carbon yeah. somewhere where the water actually flows through it. If you just throw it in the corner of your sump, it's gonna do pretty much almost nothing. Uh, it will take longer to work than a reactor will. So if you're trying to remove something rapidly yeah. from the tank, definitely use a reactor. So if you're just looking for a low cost way to remove some of the contaminants from the tank, maybe increase the par, a low cost filter sock, just filled with some carbon is a really easy way to do that. All right, so number 16, this is something that most people do and I almost would like to remove this product because uh, I think there's a better way. 
Yeah, the mistake is not considering using two single reactors instead of one dual reactor. This is one that irks me personally because I know that my flow rate for my GFO was completely different than I needed for my flow rate and contact time for my carbon. So if I was tied to, you know, using a dual reactor that had one pump, so similar flow throughout, I can't really make the fine adjustments that I want for my own tank. So separating those two out, two different pumps, makes it a heck of a lot easier to dial in. Yeah, so if you have a dual reactor, you can probably just disassemble it at a couple of fittings mm -hmm. and then have two turn them sideways. So you really just want to make sure that you're thinking about this. Even the people that sometimes Y it off of one pump, what happens is mm -hmm. then the carbon clogs, most of the water ends up starting to go through the GFO, tumbles too fast, yeah. turns itself to dust or grinds itself up. So you don't want that either. So really, this is one of those tools where you're really better off with two separate reactors running one uh, with a pump on each and then controlling the flow for each. Number 17, tiny guy. The mistake here is missing the value of that tiny five inch media reactor, you know, specifically for carbon, but it works well for smaller tanks for that mix of carbon and GFO. Uh, but if I was using it just for carbon, one, it's going to hit a, lot, a large range of tank sizes, mm -hmm. but the biggest benefit is that it's about a cup, maybe to a cup and a half of carbon that fills that five inch canister, meaning I don't have to worry about tumbling. That thing is packed full and my, works for all of my sizes of tanks. Yeah, really, the beauty of it too is you can just set it right in the sump. Oh, it yeah. can be fully submerged. It's just super easy to use. The car or the hoses on it could be right on the side of it. Mm -hmm. Pump just dangles there. It's really, really easy to use. And again, really about that sweet spot of carbon where it fits like most size tanks yeah. without it being too much or too little and just really easy to use. Okay, so related to the benefits of using that tiny guy, never, ever, ever do this. And the mistake is tumbling your carbon. I think anytime we've talked about carbon and using it in a media reactor bag or what have you, tumbling carbon is not what you want to do because it goes back to the same as you know, rinsing it. If I wash you know, the carbon like this, all I'm doing is creating more dusty fines because I'm breaking down that carbon. Tumbling the carbon does the same thing. Yeah, so it may look cooler when it's tumbling, but it's performing <laughs> worse. In fact, it's uh, not only just relate, uh, releasing all of those fines into your tank from tumbling around and grinding itself up, it's also releasing the things that it captured back mm. here into the tank. So never, ever, ever tumble carbon. All right, so number 19 is just a huge pet peeve of mine. And the mistake here is getting one of those reactors that force tumble the carbon or any of the media, in which case a lot of times water's being fed into the reactor, down through the bottom and up through the top, which inherently just causes this tumbling motion without any real way to pack and hold that carbon down. Yeah, just a big giant container, upflow, and there's nothing holding the carbon in place, so it just tumbles around and creates dust. All right, so that's probably why our canisters and the BRS reactors are so popular, mm -hmm. but also uh, Vertex actually made a really nice one yeah, back when they true. existed. Uh, <laughs> but it had a little disc that slides down and locked it in place. Yeah. And so this is one of the only reactors on the market, if you want a nice polished acrylic thing, was that, and nobody makes it anymore. So if any of you out there that make acrylic work <laughs> or uh, work in the aquarium industry want to make one that actually works proper, make sure that you can adjust the amount of media you use in this thing and hold it in place. All right, so number 20 might have sounded like a good idea, but it's just another way to create all those fines. Yeah, mistake is putting carbon directly in your filter sock where you feel like, you know, water flows fast. We talk about a high flow area, you know, that water might be just pushing the carbon down, but in reality, that turbulence inside of there just does exactly what we told you not to do, tumble the carbon and turn it into dusty fines. Yeah, I've actually seen uh, some instances where people had used like super, super hard pelletized carbon mm. and had no problem doing that, or at least they didn't think they did. And then they switched to a softer carbon and then it just ground itself to dust and the whole tank turns black. Ooh. But even with the hardest stuff, you may not notice the problem, but it's definitely turning over there. So if you thought that it was a really great idea to dump uh, some carbon in the overflow sock of your sump, uh, it may be convenient, but it's probably a bad idea. Number 21 is actually the way that I run GFO in almost every case. 
And the mistake is missing the value of mixing both of them together, in which case we're solving a couple problems here. And one is that the GFO needs to tumble so that it doesn't turn into this solid brick mass. And because we don't want carbon to tumble, we get the best of both worlds by mixing them in that one third GFO to two thirds carbon. I can now use the carbon particles to keep the GFO separated. And best of all, I don't have to tumble any of it. Yeah, in reality, we don't even really want to no. uh, tumble the GFO because any material will grind mm. itself to dust over a long enough period of time. The reason it's not as big of a deal with GFO is just because it's a lot harder material. Mm. But within that, this is a really big deal. Never, ever, <laughs> ever tumble GFO and carbon together because the GFO will absolutely grind the carbon oh, to dust yeah. because it's so much harder. So just like you said, mix it one third GFO, two thirds carbon, and the carbon will separate uh, them out and so they won't turn in that big block. You can run it at high flow rates and get the best of both worlds. So number 22, they actually make hybrid medias where they mix carbon with other filtration medias right out of the box. And the mistake is not considering those hybrid medias, you know, mixed with carbon. So GFO pulls out phosphate really well, but these resins that are mixed with this carbon can do a lot more in different jobs. So ChemiPure is one of them. Mm. They also, uh, the Purit from Brightwell is yep. one of them. So these can be a little indiscriminate though. They're pulling out all kinds of things now. Uh, many of them are pulling out metals, which may be good ones and bad ones at the same time. So I don't know if I'd run them all the time in many cases, right. but having something like Purit around the house allows for a totally different tool in the toolbox mm. here because for a lot of people, you just couldn't do a 50% water change. So oh, no. you get copper in the tank, you get some contaminant, something that you, your tank just looks like crap and you really need to get it out fast. Well, you don't have that option if you get a large tank or even if a smaller tank, you just don't have a 50% water change. So if you have something around that pulls out a vast array of uh, contaminants, a little bit less like a discriminant, and just has a broad spectrum removal mm -hmm. approach. I've seen it work in other tanks, a couple like pretty notable on YouTube. Yep. Uh, but you really want to have something like this around because it only works if you actually have it and you can't like wait around. So either ask your fish store to have this stock so you can go get it when you want it or just spend a couple bucks and have it on the shelf so it's always there when you need it. Okay, so if there's only one takeaway from all of this, let it be this. Yeah, mine today is not having carbon on hand for emergencies. So even whether it's a smaller tank, larger system where you can't just do a massive water change, having carbon on hand and you know, speaking to your last point with some of these hybrid type materials, having these things on hand to solve problems in real time should an emergency arise. And for me, if you only hear one thing, let it be this. If you look through the side of your tank and the blue <laughs> lights are off and it looks yellow, it is yellow and it is uh, hurting your par. You know, we spend so much time on lighting our tanks and getting both spectrum and par right. Just to have it hurt by a buck's worth of carbon is absolutely the wrong thing mm. to do. So take a look through your tank and decide if it's right for you and then use the carbon and then look through it again and see the stark difference. And just because we mentioned it earlier, there's actually those experiments on the carbon. You can see all the different types of carbon, how they work on different size uh, molecules and contaminants, and you can see all the performance right here.